What's up, YouTube? I'm Tron. Given the current situation with things being closed and everyone stuck inside, I thought it might be kind of fun to show you guys some of the ways I keep busy with my collection of computers. Now, over the years, I've collected a lot of machines, ranging from the very small to the somewhat large. And today, I'm going to start a YouTube channel to help kind of share and educate some of my favorite stuff so we can uh, do something other than stick inside and uh, day drink. <laughs> Sound good to you guys? So everyone knows about the Apple One and the Altair and some of the original personal computers of the 70s that get a lot of attention, a lot of press, the MSI, but a lot of people haven't thought much about a little company in Beaverton, Oregon called the Tektronix Corporation. And in 1975, they made something that I'm going to make a case today was the first graphical personal computer. That machine is the Tektronix 4051 Direct View Storage Tube Graphics Computer. Kind of a mouthful. Let's take a look. All right, so you're probably wondering what the hell is a direct view vector storage tube? The idea here is that before computers had enough memory to actually store the image on the screen for refreshing, most CRTs redraw it 30 or 60 times a second, you would actually have a CRT that behaved like an Etch-a-Sketch. It has two guns. One is an electron gun, which acts as the pen in this analogy. It steers X, Y coordinates, and actually the screen holds whatever's being written. Eventually, Tektronix adopted these types of tubes throughout their oscilloscopes and other products as well. When you press a button to clear the screen, or the software clears the screen, you see a large flash, uh, which is the flood gun, basically shaking the Etch-a-Sketch. The idea here is that the computer draws all the images programmatically, and the screen itself actually holds the content. This is how we have 1024 by 1024 graphics in the 70s. Now, everyone knows that in the 1970s there were other graphical computers like the Xerox Alto, uh, large mini computers with graphic systems that are bespoke attached to them, uh, Evans and Sutherland machines, IBM mainframes with graphics capability. But the case here for the Tektronix being the first personal graphics computer really comes from the fact that it's microprocessor based using the 6800 processor that was popular in other build-it-yourself personal computers of the time, like the SWTPC. The other aspect that makes me argue that this is a personal computer is the fact that it fits on a desk, self-contained, with storage, keyboard, graphics, and it was built in such a way that the price point was around $7,000. So, although it wasn't as inexpensive as something like a Apple One at $666, bring your own stuff, it was a lot cheaper than something like the $35,000 that an Alto or a mini computer would have cost back then. Now in 1975, this system was available with 8 to 32K of RAM and a Motorola 6800 processor, similar to the 6502 that superseded it when a bunch of pissed off Motorola employees left because they thought Motorola was mismarketing their microprocessor and went and built that 6502 that we know of in the Apple II and the Commodore 64 and other products. The 4051 was marketed sort of as a calculator for desktop visualization, whether for scientific charts or instrumentation control or even business data. And it was available with a full complement of connectivity options to connect to mainframes and mini computers, as well as a hard copy option to allow the charts and graphics produced by the system to be represented in print or in presentations. Tektronix had released standalone terminals based on the same technology before, but the 4051 was the first self-contained system. It also has a 300 kilobyte uh, tape storage mechanism built on quick cartridges uh, and out of box the basic language that it comes with supports all the graphical options and extensions that you would expect from a graphical computer. Things like drawing primitives, lines, moving the cursor, etc. For expansion and instrumentation control it also featured a GPIB port to connect to the peripherals of the time. I'm just going to put this tape in for sport here but we're not actually going to use it 
Uh, just wanted to show that capability. Again, storage peripherals in the box. This was uncommon for the time when most disc and tape systems were external. Uh, and now we're going to type in a basic program that will hopefully show off some of the graphics capabilities of this machine. Please do excuse my extremely sloppy typing. I've been drinking a lot because of COVID-19. Now that we've finished that up, let's see how this runs and go back to real time so you can see the fantastic speed at which this system calculates and draws into the CRT simultaneously. Again, this is a vector machine, so that beam is actually tracing out the exact points instead of converting into a raster or pixels and putting those on the screen. And as the beam draws, the image is retained in the CRT itself, not in memory. You might have noticed that when I backspaced while writing the program, the system is actually unable to clear the screen. It simply overwrites unless you clear the entire screen at once. So if you make a mistake when you're writing a program and hit backspace, you'll actually see the character overstrike the character you replaced. Kind of an interesting tidbit of a technology that can't redraw the screen without, again, doing the flood gun flash and redrawing everything. Anyway, here's our simple basic program drawing some kind of cool geometric shapes. In a moment, we'll show another view of this so you can actually see the program listing itself. This is running at real time, basic being interpreted rapidly by our 800 kilohertz 6800 processor. Look at that. And here I've slowed the video down to 50%. There's our flood gun clear. I'm going to type list. And there's the contents of our basic program being flashed out onto the storage tube. This time, instead of overlaying the program output with this, I'm going to hit the clear button on the keyboard or the home button. It's going to flash again. And now I'm going to type run to rerun the program. Again, look at how that writes. It's just really, really cool. The busy light comes on to let you know the processor is running, and then we start drawing again. This time again at the 50% speed of the video, but it was no speed demon before. And you can watch as it actually traces out the vectors like an Etch-a-Sketch. Now let's speed it up. Of course, no YouTube video would be complete without a look inside the box, and really this is no exception. Uh, this machine I've restored ages ago. Uh, it's already had most of the preventative maintenance done. These are not machines for the faint of heart. There's a lot of calibration that has to go on on both the analog board, uh, the digital boards tend to fail, in particular the bipolar proms on them go bad. Um, in this case, uh, I'm going to open up the, the top and, and show you the inside. One interesting tidbit, because most of the information on these tubes centers in the upper left, and these tubes are actually a wear item, they have a finite number of hours they work, one of the preventative maintenance techniques Tektronix recommends is actually rotating the tube 180 degrees every once in a while. So that that's already been done to this system, and that's nothing really unique about the 4051. It's an artifact of the storage tube technology. You just don't want to have the beam steering in the same spot all the time. Um, you might also notice at some points in the video, the system automatically dims the screen. That's right, it has a screensaver in ROM that goes ahead and uh, lowers the brightness of the storage tube to prevent wear of the phosphor and the gun. Now we have the top taken off here. Let's have a look inside. Obviously on any system like this, the electrolytic capacitors are now reaching an age where they can't be trusted. The capacitor you see on the left is original, but it is one of the few originals left in the machine. And frankly, it's there out of laziness because I forgot to include it on my order when I did the rest of it. So that is a maintenance item I will get back to. The board on the left is the analog CRT gun controller. It basically provides the amplification of the low voltage analog signals coming off of the main board uh, to actually steer the electron beam. Uh, unlike conventional CRTs, these storage tubes are not magnetically deflected. They are actually electrostatically deflected, making this an even more bizarre system to troubleshoot. But we all have to step out of our comfort zone every now and then to get cool things working. There's that board again. And now we'll take a little look in the top. Please note the latent image shown on the screen. That's kind of normal. These old electrostatic DVST tubes, they do have a little bit of image retention. After a few power cycles, that'll go away. 
In the bottom there, you can see that sort of tan board with the uh, hand-drawn traces. That is the main system board. We'll take a look at that in a second. That's where the microprocessor and the digital to analog converters that control the gun on the CRT actually live. Um, and again, there's that amplification board. And here's the board from the bottom of the frame. This is, for lack of a better word, the motherboard. In a moment, a disembodied hand will point out some of the support logic. These are Motorola support chips from the 6800 family. Over on the left of my finger is the DRAM, and then over where my fingers are now is the ROM, which uh, stores the operating system, for lack of a better word, of the machine, the basic interpreter. Just out of frame, my finger is pointing to the 6800 microprocessor, and now this is the actual digital-to-analog conversion logic that drives the CRT itself. All on one board, very compact, very concise. Good job, Tektronix. Now, frankly, I haven't worked on my 4051s in quite a while, so some of the information in this video may be slightly erroneous or inaccurate. Um, I had that context kind of paged in about four years ago when I restored the ones I use today. Um, some things have fallen off the wagon, admittedly, like that last cap that doesn't seem to be hurting anything. When you have a lot of machines, you sometimes make little trade-offs uh, to fix the more pressing issues and, you know, let some things slide. So please no flames or hate mail if, uh, if I made a mistake in the video. There's a lot of gear here, and over the coming weeks, I look forward to showing you all the other stuff I've restored because there's a lot of it, and it's all in this house, and, well, I'm not going anywhere for at least a few months. Thanks for watching. Take care.